and the uh, members of YET. Um, is that correct? It's YET, isn't it? It's uh, IYWD, the oh, Institute IYWD. for Young IYWD. Women in Development. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us to this meeting. And uh, we are so grateful for uh, allowing us to give you an opportunity to present your, uh, what can I say, your contribution towards the Constitutional Amendment Bill as uh, required in terms of Section 141 of the Constitution. Uh, so I'll uh, let you proceed with the meeting, Ms. Matamanazo, and the hope all honorable members are now connected to participate in this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair. Um, it would be useful for us to please have just introductions from all the honorable members present um, and the representatives of the NGOs that will be speaking today. So may I begin with um, Honorable Chombo. I believe um, Honorable Chombo is a member of the committee. Are you available? I'm going in alphabetical order. No? Honorable Dube. Honorable Gomez. I didn't expect Honorable Chombo to be present because she's now a member of the executive. So I'm not surprised if she's not in the meeting. Thank you, sir. Thank you for supporting me with the correction. Um, that's the spirit of the meeting. Um, perhaps Honorable Gonese can go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Innocent Gonese, MP from Charlie Central. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Honorable Kashiri. Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Cecil Kashiri from Magunje, Urungwe, Mash Best. Super. Thank you for joining us. Honorable Machingura. Honorable Machingura, can you hear me? All right, maybe they can join us later. Honorable Madziva. Honorable Madziva is now a member of executive. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Honorable Madziva, could you go ahead? Honorable Madziva, good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable Masango. Good morning. Thank you. I'm Honorable Member of Parliament for Mangura Constituents. Thank you very much. Honorable Mashonganyika. Why is my name missing? We. Sorry, honorable members, um, I'm speaking in alphabetical order according to a list that I was supplied. You are welcome to correct me as I go along. Uh, honorable Mavunga. All right. Uh -huh. Honorable Mawire. Honorable Mchenje. Honorable Mpame. Honorable Munetsi. Honorable Munetsi, Makoni North constituents. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure to have you on the meeting. Thank you for joining My us. My pleasure, thanks. Honorable Mutambisa. Indeed. Mutambisi. Mutambisi. Thank you for the correction. Mm -hmm. Member of Parliament, Midlands Province. Ah, Midlands. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Honorable Mue. Honorable Mue. 
Honorable Ndebele. Honorable Ndebele. All right. Honorable Nduna. I'll proceed. Honorable Nguenya. Honorable Pulu. Honorable Raiza. Uh, good morning, Honorable Mark Raiza from Berengwa East Constituency. Thank you. Thank, thank you for joining us all the way from Berengwa. Thank you. We appreciate your time. Honorable Sanya Twe. Morning. Hello, how are you? Honorable Sibanda. Livuganjani, Kamalami Nkosazona Swanda, from Bulawayo Metropolitan. Ah. Thank you. Welcome. Honorable Sikala. Honorable Sitole. Honorable Zemura. And last but not least, I'll ask the committee clerk, Honorable Joe, to say hello to us. Good, good morning. My name is Joe Tafanana. I represent Berengwa North Constituents, Midlands Province. Thank you very much. I see some others have joined us and are raising their, their hands. I Chikwama. think you left me. I think you left me in alphabetical order. Misai I'm sorry. Hello, Honorable Misai Rabwi. Um, you're not on this list. Thank you. It's nice to hear your voice. Hello, Bella. Probably also, threw me, they threw Bella. me out of the committee. Bella. <laughs> Hello, Bella. Hello, yes. Bella. Again. Honorable, Honorable Chirichena from Midlands. Chirichena from Midlands Province. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us, Honorable Chirichena. Who else also, have we left out? From Chikomba. Ah. From Chikomba. Yes, Chikomba. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Anybody else? And also, Honorable Elizabeth Aha. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Uh -huh. Yes? Yeah, maybe just to 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 correct the the anomaly. You 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 seem to have used a, an odd list. Uh, the committee uh, has got now a different um, member. Okay. So, so maybe, yeah, maybe you maybe. also left my name. Left Please go ahead, sir, and introduce yourself, honourable. Yes. I'm Honorable Murire, ah, member of Parliament from Chikawan Constituent. Excellent. We're very happy to have you here. Is there anybody else who's missing? Excellent. I will hand over now um, to Glanis uh, Changachirere, who is from the Institute for Young Women in Development. And Glanis, if you could say some um, introductory remarks on behalf of the civil society groups that you have convened, please. Thank you, Bella. Um, honorable members of parliament, here in represented as members of the Portfolio Committee on Justice, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs, through the committee chairperson, uh, the leadership of the Institute for Young Women Development, our fellow co conveners the Elections Resource Center, Youth Empowerment and Transformation Trust, Women's Coalition of Zimbabwe, um, We Lead Trust, Deaf Women Included, and the Alliance for Community-Based Organizations. Other CSO leaders here present, young women, women, men, and youth of Zimbabwe here present, I welcome you to this uh, important meeting. 
uh, between ourselves as citizens and our august house of the parliament. This meeting focuses on the agenda of young women of advancing 50, 50 and 25% representation of women and young women in elective politics at local government and parliament in Zimbabwe. As we host this meeting, we have this meeting at a very important time. Firstly, we are having this meeting at a time when the parliament has announced the dates and schedule of public hearings for the constitutional amendment bill number two. Um, secondly, we are having this meeting at a very difficult time in the world because of the global health pandemic of COVID-19 which situation has put the general citizens of the world and in particular young women and women in marginalized communities at an even more precarious situation. As we host this meeting, I would like on behalf of our co-conveners to request the august uh, members of parliament here present to listen to our plea taking into account the difficult situation that young women, women and people in marginalized communities have been put because of, co of the COVID-19 pandem uh, COVID pandemic and think about how they are actually being re restricted to participate in decision making and influencing processes that, beyond, that are beyond their reach due to the technical marginalization that they experience. Without fa uh, much further ado, I would like to appreciate your time and to appreciate our facilitator and invite her to proceed with the meeting as per our shared agenda. Thank you and uh, over to you, Bella. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glanis, for those words of welcome uh, to our honorable parliamentarians. I believe we've been joined by Honorable Berita Chikwama, um, perhaps you can say good morning to, to your colleagues. Uh, tech support, if you could kindly unmute her for us so that we can hear her. Good Thank morning, you, Tech. Everyone. Good morning. It's wonderful to have you on the call. So I believe the agenda has been shared with everybody. Um, we are going to meet until just before one o'clock with your indulgence. Um, IYWD will do the presentation on behalf of civil society, supported um, by uh, colleagues and comrades from civil society. Uh, we hope that Election Resource Center will also um, make an input together with IYWD. We will then request your committee of honorable members to please offer your response, your feedback. Um, and then we will take questions and comments from those who are participating, but who are not necessarily representing civil society organizations um, in a formal capacity in terms of the agenda. Just a brief Q and A. Lastly, we'll have closing remarks from IYWD and ERC, and then um, we will close our meeting at 12.50. So, um, Glanis, if your team could kindly lead with making the input that you have prepared and shared with the committee, please go ahead. And tech support, could you kindly mute everyone else's microphones? Tech support, could you bring up Glanis's microphone, please? Thank you, Glanis. Your microphone is unmuted. Please proceed. Thank you, Bella. Tech support kindly um, assist by sharing the presentation or the paper on the screen. So we go through it together. Okay, just.
So while I await for my colleagues to upload the paper here on the screen for everybody to see it, although it has also been shared um, individually via email earlier on, um, I would just like to say that this paper is a culmination of um, wider and a number of consultations that the Institute for Young Women Development, uh, the Electoral Resource Center, and uh, a number of other CSOs that are part of this process have conducted with various constituencies that they work with um, across the entire country. Um, this is a process that uh, began prior to the promulgation of Constitutional Amendment Bill Number no. 2. So it's a process that began in 2017, where we consulted um, women, young women, men, and the entire citizens of Zimbabwe on what they would envision, envisage to see in terms of um, the implementation of uh, constitutional provisions around gender parity and youth representation. Um, while this paper has been tabled before parliament through the deputy speaker of parliament in november together in partnership with uh, the zimbabwe gender commission um, we have seen the introduction or rather the gazetting of the constitutional amendment bill number two uh, which make proposals that uh, somehow affect um, the shared position um, and we are taking this time as an opportunity to engage again with the parliamentary committee and other um, key institutions of government to reiterate um, the calls from young women and uh, women that we work in around what they want to see on gender equality. We are also taking this position as our submission and therefore response to the country uh, to the constitutional amendment bill number two proposal particularly uh, clause number 11. Um, now that we have the paper on the screen i will slowly go through the paper um, and i think in the interest of time i will read out where it's uh, very specific and i will try and add um, some comments where i think requires additional uh, clarification. And after presenting the paper, we'll still remain open to engage on issues that would still require clarification. This paper is a position on 50, 50 and 25 uh, percent representation of women and young women in elective positions at local government and parliament in Zimbabwe. We are submitting this paper officially today Tuesday, the 9th of June, 2020, to the Parliament of Zimbabwe. At this very meeting that has been convened with the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee on Justice, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs by the Institute for Young Women Development, um, in partnership with the Women's Coalition of Zimbabwe, Deaf Women inclu Included, Elections Resource Center, Youth Empowerment and Transformation Trust, yet we lead and other civil society organizations. This is our urgent call to the Parliament of Zimbabwe to withdraw Constitutional Amendment Bill Number no. Two and rather enact a gender equality law that provides for 50 50 representation and 25% representation of both women and 25. Uh, sorry, um, I will start again. This is an urgent call to the Parliament of Zimbabwe to withdraw Constitutional Amendment Bill Number no. 2 and rather enact a gender equality law that provides for 50-50 and 25% representation of women and young women in elective positions at local government and parliament in line with the Constitution of Zimbabwe Amendment Number no. 20 Act. The background to this call is based on the findings by the Zimbabwe Gender Commission of 2018 that, uh, that arose from their preliminary election monitoring report on Zimbabwe's 2018 harmonized elections that although women constituted many voters, their participation as candidates was limited as evidenced by the low number of women who succeeded in the primary elections of different political parties in the 2018 election. 
This resulted in 15% uh, being women uh, contesting for National Assembly and 17% contesting at local government. Our plea is also greatly informed by the Zimbabwe Electoral uh, Commission uh, gender inclusion policy of 2020 to 2024, where the commission pledges to promote gender equality and inclusivity in electoral processes as one of its core objectives. Since its enactment in, the, uh, in 2013, the Constitution of Zimbabwe provided a transitory mechanism towards gender parity by providing a constitutional quota of 60 additional reserved seats for women in parliament. And with this statement, we interpret it as uh, that the Constitution provided the 60 uh, seats as a way towards getting to the full realization of gender parity and on the assumption that by the end of the two terms that the uh, quarter was supposed to run, uh, the socio-economic and political environment would have opened up and actually facilitate uh, the active participation of women and young women in unhindered ways. Um, as we are aware, this quarter is due to end in 2023. And on face value, as we look at this uh, quarter, we acknowledge that it actually resulted in a slight increase in women's representation in parliament, both in 2013 and 2018. Women's representation increased from 19% in 2008 to 35% and 31% in 2019 and 2018 respectively. While these incremental gains are celebrated, lessons from the design of the current quarter, as well as the constitutional provision on gender equality, um, point to the urgent need to enact a gender equality law that provides for 50-50 women's representation um, in order to avoid loss of gains that have been made in the past. Gender equality as we see it is not only about women and their right to participate, but is also a prerequisite for the development of the country and the African continent at large. It is a pathway to Africa's agenda 2063, which Zimbabwe and the Southern African Development Committee have committed to. Additionally, Zimbabwe is a signatory to the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women among other regional and international instruments that seek to advance the status of women in society. So we totally acknowledge that our country has um, expressed commitment to gender parity by um, uh, signing on to regional and international instruments that seek to advance gender equality. It is against this background that as the women of Zimbabwe, in our diversity and from all walks of life are calling upon the Parliament of Zimbabwe to enact a gender equality act that provides for 50-50 representation of women, including women with disabilities in local government and parliament. In the spirit of youth inclusivity, the law must also secure 25% of the 50% of women's seats for young women, including young women with disabilities who are below the ages of 35. The Institute for Young Women Development and its core conveners note that Clause 11 of the Constitutional Amendment Bill Number 2 departs from this constitutional uh, spirit of gender parity and meaningful youth representation in local government and parliament. And we are aware that the Parliament of Zimbabwe has the power to ensure the provisions of the Constitution of Zimbabwe are upheld and that all institutions and agencies of government at every level act constitutionally and in the national interest as provided by section 112 subsection 2 of the Constitution. So we acknowledge the oversight role of the Parliament in ensuring that the constitutional dictates are followed by different uh, institutions of government. 
and recognizing that Zimbabwe is founded on the principle of gender equality and non-discrimination as stipulated by section three, subsection G, subsec uh, one, subsection G of the constitution. Um, and appreciating that section 17 of the constitution mandates the state to promote full gender balance in all spheres of Zimbabwean society and to take legislative measures needed to ensure that both genders are equally represented in all agencies of government at every level and that women constitute at least half the membership of all elective bodies established under the constitution or any act of parliament. And deeply concerned by the reduced number of women and young women in elected posts in parliament, which signify inertia and lack of commitment by government to faithfully and effectively implement sections 17, 20, 56, and 80 of the constitution. And yearning for a Zimbabwean society where the rights of women, young women, youth, and people living with disability are protected and both are equally represented in politics and decision-making positions. Now, therefore, beseech the Parliament of Zimbabwe, number one, to stop amending the constitution and putting in place inadequate measures that are, un that are unconstitutional towards gender parity and youth inclusion. We believe that the constitution already stipulates what Zimbabwe needs to see in terms of implementation of, or rather realizing gender parity. We believe that amending the constitution to add other mechanisms is actually going against the dictates of the 2013 constitution. And number two, um, to ensure the full implementation of the supreme law of the land, and number three, that the Parliament of Zimbabwe establishes a legal and policy framework that unequivocally promotes gender parity, youth and dis disability inclusion as prescribed by, as prescriptively provided by the spirit and letter of section 17, 20, 22, 56 and 80 of the 2013 constitution. We therefore reinstate our position as follows. These are the proposals we are making that instead of proceeding with amending the constitution, the parliament of Zimbabwe actually need to take, to consider alternative measures. Number one, we recommend the parliament of Zimbabwe to withdraw clause 11 of the constitutional amendment bill number two we believe that it undermines the constitutional and democratic rights of women and youth to fully participate in all aspects of social life, political life, and economic life in Zimbabwe. Number two, we call upon the Parliament of Zimbabwe to fully implement the supreme law of the land and demand the enactment of a specific piece of legislation, namely the Gender Equality Act, and the act must make it mandatory for the original 210 members of parliamentary seats and 1,958 local government seats to consist of at least 50% reserved for women and of that 50%, 25% to be re reserved for young women. Young women refer to women under the age of 35 years. Each member of parliament and local government will thus be allocated a specific constituency. We implore the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission to bring to life section five, subsection D1 of the Electoral Act, chapter nine, um, 23, that mandates it to ensure that gender is mainstreamed into electoral processes through amending section 46, of the Electoral Act, Chapter 213. For each party to be eligible to participate for seats at local government and the National Assembly, it must have satisfied the prerequisite of the total party candidacy to be 50% women, and of that 50%, 25% must be young women under the age of 35. This law needs to be reflected in the electoral law 
end as well clearly articulates punitive measures that have institutional, operational, and budgetary impl implications to actors who fail to comply with that. We call upon the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission to reserve 50% of the seats at local government and national assembly for the election of female candidates for two terms uh, of elections in a row with the rotation of the chosen constituencies every third round of elections in Zimbabwe. We are calling upon ensuring that women who get into local government and parliament actually occupy um, active seats and we acknowledge the need to rotate the seats so that not one specific constituent remains um, a women reserved uh, constituents throughout uh, our entire life. We believe that giving an opportunity to all citizens to experience women leadership actually can contribute towards uh, positive change in terms of attitudes, in terms of behavior, but also gives women an opportunity to deliver for their different communities. An immediate amendment of Section 3 um, of the Political Parties Finance Act Chapter 211, Section 3, which talks of financing of political parties. Um, we are seeking that there be a mandatory monetary incentive from the state's purse awarded to political parties who are compliant with equal women representation in local government and the National Assembly. Upon disbursement of such funds, the beneficiaries of the funds must use the funds to further the agenda of women in politics and will be called upon to account how this was done. Failure to do so should result in a refund to the state PES. We believe the state has an active role in ensuring that our parties are compliant with gender parity provisions and youth inclusion provisions, and they actually can play a role in incentivizing parties to uphold such good practices. And failure of the parties to then um, demonstrate how they continuously support um, or provide space for women and youth participation, particularly through financing, need to be acted upon by the state as well. And lastly, in light of funding being a barrier to women flourishing in politics and in an attempt to level the playing field, we recommend that the Political Parties Finance Act Chapter 211 contain a clause that limits the amount of money to be utilized specifically for the election of a particular candidate. We believe that um, financial um, disadvantage is one of the factors that have continuously hindered women given the historical position of, uh, where women uh, usually have less access to economic resources and financing and therefore their campaigns are very much under-resourced. And if the government can therefore put a limit to which um, each candidate can economically uh, or financially resource an election. That means it levels the playing field for women and they can be able to contest even without um, enough financial resources. From myself, for and on behalf of the core conveners of this process, the Institute for Young Women Development, the Election Resource Center and Network, um, with deaf women included, We Lead Trust, Youth Empowerment and Transformation Trust, and the Women's Coalition of Zimbabwe. We hope that you will consider our plea as imperative to ensuring that Zimbabwe actually attains its commitments to gender parity, youth and disability inclusion as stipulated in our constitution. I thank you. And Bella, I hand um, back to you. Thank you very much, Glanis. Um, excellent presentation there, Glanis. Thank you so much for being loyal to the spirit and to the letter of the, um, the plea that you have before Parliament. Honourable members of the committee, I'd like to um, give us a few moments to recognise the presence of a few of the leaders of civil society 
and constitutional commissions. I see that we've been joined by um, the CEO of the Zimbabwe Gender Commission, Mrs. Virginia Mwanigwa. If you could unmute your microphone, Virginia, and say hello uh, to our honorable members and also to the other participants on this call, we'd appreciate it. Hello, everybody. It is good to be here. I hope we're all safe. Thank and you. And well very... done for the petition I've just had. Thank you very much, Virginia. I see we have Roswita Katande, who is the National Coordinator of the Youth Empowerment and Transformation Trust. Roswita, would you kindly unmute your mic and um, offer your greetings to the meeting, please? Okay. Um, all protocol is observed. Um, a very good um, morning um, to all of you, and uh, it's great being part of this very important conversation. Thank you. Um, I see that we have a representative from HIVOS, which is one of the key partners that provides resources, especially to women's organizations doing gender equality work of this nature, Tambudzai Madzimure. Could you kindly unmute your microphone and say hello? Good morning, everyone, and thanks very much to IYWD and partners for convening this very important meeting. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to note that we've been joined by Sakile Sifelani, uh, the director of the Women in Politics Support Unit. Saki, if you could unmute your microphone um, and say hello to the participants. <laughs> Good morning to everybody. Um, thank you for being here and I hope everyone is staying safe. Thank you, Saki. Um, we have someone from We Lead, Namatai. Um, are you on the call? I think you are. If you could unmute your microphone and just offer your greetings, please. Namatai? Let me go on to uh, Tembile Pute. She's from PACT, which also supports young women's organizations in doing their gender equality work. Tembile, would you like to say good morning? Kindly unmute your microphone. All right, I'll carry on. Um, I think we have someone from the Women's Coalition. Who has joined us from the Women's Coalition? Is it Sally Lura? Yes, thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Farirai Mudiwa, the Mutare Chapter Coordinator. Thank you very much. What about the Women in Law in Southern Africa, Wilsa? Are you on the call? Uh, Fadzai Traquino? Colleagues, I can't see everybody um, according to your names. Sometimes I'm seeing the identity of your telephones. So if I've overlooked introducing you, please forgive me, just send me a note via the chat and I'll um, give you a moment to say hello. Um, I'd like now to hand over with the permission of the committee to the Election Resource Center representative. Um, is it Tawanda Chimini who is joining us? Thank you uh, and good morning to, to everybody. Um, I, the suggestion here was that I would add my voice, the voice of the Election Resource Center pertaining to the implications on youth and gender in terms of uh, electoral processes arising from the proposals and what is currently in the Constitution. Um, as already highlighted through Glani's presentation, I think the insistence that we maintain remains necessary in the considerations being made by the portfolio to the constitutional amendment bill is that there be a full appreciation only of some token um, allocation of seats to certain sections of our society without entering between the building blocks that actually allow the inclusive participation process. Here, electoral processes 
are not just the election themselves. Um, they are, and, and by elections themselves, no, ordinarily we then refer to, to polling day and uh, whether or not people participate in the elections. The thinking behind the submissions that we're making is that while the constitution makes it very clear around 50-50 representation, the investment the moment must be towards ensuring the voting law are uh, put in place sure that such participation is not just at high level. It has to start right set from ensuring that number one, you are not just allocating seats because there are steps that must be taken to get the women uh, or young women or persons with disabilities. So them the seats without ensuring they have equal process may not be sufficient. Hence, the reference to quality act gives effect to what the constitution is already providing as a point. Number two, in the electoral act. So rather than rushing to the constitution and making more amendments, We seem to have lost uh, Tawanda. Tawanda, in, your sound has deteriorated. Um, so I'm going to ask that Onai Hara please introduce herself. Onai is a sign language interpreter uh, working with deaf women included. Please introduce yourself and then please also introduce your colleagues from deaf women included. Thank you, Onai. So my name is Onai Hara. I'm with Agnes. She has given me her words. Uh, she's Agnes Chindimba from Deaf Women Included, and we are happy to be here and to contribute to this IOS. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for using the sign language uh, for the honorable members to also appreciate. Maybe you could do it just one more time. Teach us how to say hello, Onai. So this is hello. Okay, honorable members, can I see hello, you saying hello everyone. in sign language for your disability community? Can I see you? Hello. hello. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, honorable members. Uh -huh. And that's how you say thank you. Can you teach us how to say thank you? Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Touching your chin. My honorable. Can I teach you tender? Ma. Uh, ne sign language. I believe there's a representative from the Zimbabwe Election Support Network, as well as a representative from um, MISA Zimbabwe. Could you please um, introduce yourselves and we will proceed with the remainder of our meeting. Zesen, over to you. Um. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kundai Chingara, and I'm representing Zimbabwe Election Support Network. Welcome, Kundai. It's good to have you on the call. Um, and from Misa, was it Nyasha? I think I saw Nyasha's name being flagged for me. All right. Anybody else from civil society that I've overlooked introducing? Okay. So in terms of the presentations, honorable members, you've heard from the organizations their requests. I'm going to now um, ask if you have a, a response to their input, any observations that you would like to make. Um, I'm afraid that we're not sitting in a room where I can see you, um, but what I'll try and do is request tech support to spotlight our honorable members so that those who want to speak um tech support if you could mute your mic um if our honorable members would like to respond please show by uh raising your hand and being very active on your screen where possible. Yes, uh, committee chair, over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Bella. 
Um, before I invite uh, my fellow honorable members to make their comments, I just want to respond. Kindly unmute yourself, Chair. I've muted everyone else. Sorry, Chair, kindly unmute yourself. I had muted everyone else. Okay, I think it, you can hear me now, isn't it? There is some background noise, maybe it's from your end. Okay, okay. Um, I'm sure everyone is muted themselves now. Can you hear me now clearly? We still have that background, but you may okay. press it. Let's see how it goes. Okay. Yeah, so I, I would like to respond to the, the passionate plea for uh, Parliament to drop uh, the Constitutional Amendment Bill. Uh, my response is, in, in terms of the law, uh, the committee or Parliament at this stage cannot drop a bill that has been introduced into the House by the executive in terms of uh, Section 131 of the Constitution. And uh, for a constitutional amendment bill, it has to be within the precincts of the law, in this case, in terms of Section 328 uh, of the Constitution. So as long as due notice has been given, uh, as members of parliament or as the uh, committee for justice, we are mandated to take the bill to the people so that the members of the public have an opportunity to have their input in terms of section 141 of the constitution. So as it is right now, we cannot do anything we cannot drop the bill. What we need to do is to provide members of the public the opportunity to have their say in the bill. Then after that, we will take the bill and the, compile a report, uh, gathering all the views from members of the public. Then after we have prepared the report, we table it in parliament and members of parliament will then have an opportunity to debate the bill after the second reading of the bill. It is at that stage that the members can then maybe make recommendations to have the, uh, either the bill dropped or amendments to the bill. So what I request members of the public is that if your contribution is that the bill should be dropped, then you should do, uh, make it clear in your submissions so that when we compile our report, we take a, a notice of that. But as it is right now, it's impossible or it's not provided by the law that we can drop the bill. So that's the comment I wanted to make. And at this juncture, I will invite my fellow members of parliament to also make their contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, from the uh, lineup, I see that we have a contribution from Honorable Misi. Honorable Misi, could you please go ahead and make your contribution? And then you will yes. be followed by Honorable Gonese. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Bella. Um, I just need clarification on, uh, I probably may have missed it or didn't hear it properly. Am I hearing that the proposal is that um, section 11 is provided for in the bill, be scrapped, be withdrawn, which would mean, in other words, we are saying, or you are saying, you are submitting to us that uh, the quota both the quota for uh, women and the proposed quota for youth be, be scrapped. Did I hear you properly? 
Um, the, the second one is perhaps an appreciation on the issue of the rotational, uh, uh, rotational um, strategy where there is a proposal that uh, for a particular period of time, we have seats that are designated as women only. So let's assume you have 105 that you are designating as the uh, women only. What are you saying about the other 105? Will those be designated as men only? Or are they designated as both for men and for, for women? I, I seem to have uh, had uh, some confusion about linking the Political Finances Act to a reward mechanism. Is that an alternative or are you now, are you saying, because if you do the rotational, I'm assuming you don't have to reward because you already have got 105 and 105. Or are you saying if you don't get the alternative, if you don't get the, the rotational, then uh, you think that the Political Finances Act should therefore be, be amended. Then finally, I also get quite confused by the statement, uh, don't do anything to the Constitution, whilst at the same time, you seem to be suggesting that uh, we take away the issue around uh, section 11 as provided into into this particular bill so i still i was all over the place in terms of hearing where what exactly your your submissions were but again it may just have been if we are not looking at each other you kind of miss some of the things uh, thank you bell thank you honorable miss Irabui. um we will allow the honorable members to give you all their feedback, Glanis and your delegation, and then you can offer some responses. Honorable Gonesi, you are up next. After you is Honorable Mavetera. Honorable Gonesi, over to you. Could you kindly unmute your microphone? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bila. And I really want to thank you or the comprehensive uh, presentation. Because in the past, you normally get people making proposals without dealing with the how part. And I'm happy that uh, you've given your comprehensive proposals. But as the Honorable Chair has said, I think the chain is already in motion. And uh, we may need now to look at uh, the situation as it stands in terms of uh, the bill as having already been gazetted and public hearings due to commence next week. My question to you would be for you to clarify when you are suggesting that uh, we should then wait for a gender law. Will this uh, proposed gender law entail amendments to the constitution as well? I know that is just a proposal that you are making. And then secondly, on the issue of the youth quota, I noticed that I have uh, focused on the seats being reserved for women and young women. My question is, what do you have in mind for the young men, because at present they are not uh, covered in catered. I don't know whether you've uh, applied your minds to that uh, scenario so that at least when you're talking with young people, they are covering uh, both genders. Because I think it's also important not to have uh, discrimination in reverse. And below. In terms of the definition of youth is 15 to 35, and I want to have some clarity as to whether the participation for young women would be confined to those who are above the age of 21, which is the age at which one can contest for elections, or do you want it to be lowered to below 21? So these are the issues which I would want you to clarify. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable. Um, they have built on the issues that Honorable Misaira Bui raised. We will now hear from Honorable Mavetera. If you could kindly phone um, and make your contribution, we'd appreciate that. All right, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank you for the presentation. 
Um, but I'm, I'm, um, I just wanted to say, um, I'm looking at the issue, uh, especially of the youth quota. Uh, it's good that now we are raising it. We are saying that we need 25% uh, of, the, of the young people, especially on the sixes. I think that is with the uh, recording, to be honest, and we really want to appreciate that myself. Um, as much as it is, uh, when it comes to those six seats already, uh, one thing that I've understood with a past experience, uh, I've, I've realized that um, you come to think that um, as much as it is, considering now that there's this youth quota, uh, they would be thinking that at least we, uh, the young people are represented. Uh, what do you think we also need to go a step forward probably from the decision makers when it comes to, to, to the six seats? Because when it comes to that, truly speaking, for us to behave, uh, uh, broke the ground when it comes to us saying that young people should be represented on that. I think we need to go a step forward on getting the buy-in so that at least uh, even when it comes to us as parliamentarians, being able to also speak on that issue, it would go a long way. So I was just uh, calling upon uh, the decision makers at all parties so that at least we can also get this engagement of young people being able to be represented on the sixes. That is a noble stance and I think we greatly appreciate even us in parliament will also be able to debate it. But I just thought maybe there's another way that could actually be able to navigate on that issue. And then on the 10 seats uh, that are reserved for the young people as well, uh, which are 10, uh, this rotational basis of us saying that at least we needed, the first part of course was we needed at least saying at least it should be 50-50 when it comes to those 10 seats. But looking at it, I'm saying to myself, even looking at the 105 that you're proposing, you are saying that we would need to reset an area for men. Uh, I'm looking at that policy, really, or looking at that, um, if I were going to, 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 to lobby for something like that, or maybe advocate for, for that issue. I'm saying to myself, uh, is, isn't there another way that we can be able to use? Because that reservation, sometimes some people might feel as if probably it's, it's, it's quite oppressive. That's the thing of other people. What other way do you think we can be able to have for us to be able to make sure that at least we get that 105 seats? It's very good. That's my own personal opinion. But of course, we are going to also hear what the public says. And of course, when we meet the civic society, they are there to also guide us. On the 105, besides us saying that we are going to reserve certain areas to women, what other measures can we be able to use so that at least we get that 50-50? That's my take. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Honorable Mavetera. Um, yes, I can see the hands going up. Let me, let me ask uh, Honorable Mushkambisi. Mutambisi, could you unmute your microphone? Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Maybe I missed this one. In your report, I didn't identify where, who is going to choose or select that this constituency is going to be for women and this one is going to be for men. Thank you. Excellent, Excellent contribution. Thank you very much, ma'am. Anybody else? You are able using technology to raise your hand. Um, Hi, Hi, Elena. Yes, please go ahead. Can you identify yourself? There's no name. Galaxy Tab A, that's Honorable Kashiri. Aha, uh -huh. please go ahead, Honorable. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good, thanks to Glenn. the whole amendment bill in its entirety. And then you went on now to say, no, we should, uh, we should withdraw clause 11. If you want, if as a civil service organization, you want, to, you want the bill to be withdrawn, why then go and say, now we want clause 11 to be withdrawn? And instead they have gender equality act inserted in. Um, that, that, that alone, I think you need to, rephrase it and, and present it in a, in a way that people understand. If you want the entire bill to be withdrawn, stick to that. If you want the bill to go through and just let clause 11 be withdrawn, state it as it is. And then from there, um, the Political Parties Finances Act, Chapter 2, Subsection 11, I think, 
where you were calling that they should they kept in financing of the elections so that there is a level field, level playing field for both men and women. My question is how realistic is that going to be? What mechanisms will have to be put in place? And how will this be managed? You know? It's it's I'm I'm just thinking about is there no other way you can come around it and present it in a manner that people really do understand and see the reality of it. Those are the two two or three points that I just wanted to check with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have Honorable Zemura. Um, she's been trying to raise her hand. Yes, ma'am. Please, can you speak up? Honorable Zemura, can you unmute your microphone for us, please? I saw someone supporting you in the background. Could you ask your assistant to help you um, make sure that, yes, your microphone is on. Please go ahead. Uh, I, I heard you saying that uh, women's quota should rotate their constituencies. Uh, may I please know how? Because these constituencies have only one woman representative. So if we rotate, which way do we do it? Do it, do it, do it? <laughs> Excellent question. <laughs> Thank you very much, Honorable Zemria. And it's so nice to see you using the technology. Well done, Mama. Well done. Congratulations. Um, there are hands going up. If I can't recognize you, please try and post your hand up in the, um, on your screen so that I can see your hand using the technology um, or try and wave very aggressively in front of your screen. Uh, Honorable Sibanda, Honorable Sibanda, is that your hand you wanted to contribute? No? Okay. I think those are the contributions we have at the moment. Before I hand over um, to Glanis and I see Tawanda is back from Election Resource Center, um, I wanted to recognize that um, we have on the call a colleague from one of IYWD's partner organizations that also provides funding for them. Um, I've been sent the name. Is it Glanis? If you could assist with the name of the person rather than the organization, because I don't see the organizational name. Natasha, Natasha, Natasha Vestmore. Natasha Vestmore, would you like to say hello, Natasha, uh, to your colleagues so that they also can meet you on the call? Um, please unmute yourself and just say a brief hello. Hello, everybody. Hello, honorables and uh, um, civil society in Zimbabwe. Thank you for inviting me to the conversation. All right, thank you. Um, so we've kept the comments open. We are requesting in line with uh, civility that we please do not post things that can upset each other. Um, so I've been requested to remind participants to please only post those comments that are constructive for our dialogue. Um, I know the culture in parliament is uh, a little bit exciting but we don't want your names to forever exist in history in Zoom with some of the comments that are beginning to come up on the screens. I'll hand over to you now, Glanis, and you can respond to the comments and then you can be supported by your colleagues from civil society um, as you deem appropriate, as well as by Tawanda. Roswita, I see that you also want to support Glanis. So after Glanis has spoken, Roswita, you can chip in. Um, please go ahead, Glanis. Your microphone, Glanis. Unmute your microphone, please, Glanis. Um, I think I'm no longer on mute. Um, okay. 
Thank you, Bella. And thank you very much to the honorable members uh, for the very critical and quite engaging and thought provoking questions that you've raised to all of us um, from civil society. Um, I, I will not, um, you know, grab everything uh, at this point. I want to allow colleagues um, to quickly chip in and uh, help respond to uh, many of the questions that have been posed and I will remain available as well uh, as we continue. So Bella, I've seen a number of colleagues who have already raised their hands. You can proceed um, to engage them. All right, thank you, Glanis. Roswita Katsande from YET. Please, can you go ahead? Kindly unmute your microphone. Um, thank you, uh, Bella. Um, I just want to um, respond to two um, comments that have been raised. Um, the first one being the position of civil society with regards to um, constitutional amendment number two, view, and also uh, comment on, on the youth um, quota system, uh, the, youth, the proposed court, youth quota um, as per the constitutional amendment. Um, so maybe to start off, uh, I just want to maybe highlight uh, that as civil society organizations, uh, we are very extremely concerned uh, at the rapid amendment of the uh, constitution and we are against the um, constitutional amendment bill number two in its entirety. And we feel that um, the constitution of Zimbabwe is the supreme law of uh, the country and we are concerned that um, the government should be working on ensuring full implementation of the constitution. And um, so we are against um, the whole constitutional amendment. I think just to put into context the uh, questions that have been raised and just to say maybe for this uh, specific position paper that we are presenting, we are focusing mainly on uh, the women's quota and young women uh, participation. Um, I'll move on to um, the concerns or comments that have come across with pertaining the, uh, the youth quota system. Um, I'm from Youth Empowerment and Transformation Trust, uh, and we are also against the proposed uh, youth quota, uh, the 10 seats in the National Assembly. Um, when you read through it on the surface, it appears uh, um, as if it's a positive development. Uh, but however, we note that the 10 seats will not, is not going to increase the number of young people uh, in parliament. So we are proposing that we need to ensure that um, the government uh, come up with uh, maybe, instead of amending the constitution, there are various uh, alternatives that we can look at, like having a legal candidate quota, a voluntary quota for youth, increasing youth participation in local government elections. Um, and so, so we are against that youth uh, quota system uh, and we are also recommending that um, instead of us amending the constitution, we need to have a legislative framework that can strengthen youth participation through the enactment of uh, a youth act uh, so that we can have section 20 of the constitution of Zimbabwe uh, fully operationalized. So I just wanted to highlight that uh, those two points to say we are against the um, constitutional amendment view in its entirety and uh, also so the position with regards to the youth quota system. Thank you, Bella. Thank you very much, Roswita from mm -hmm. YET. Um, you will be now um, listening to Sakile Sifelani from Women in Politics Support Unit, and then she will be followed by uh, Virginia Mwanigwa from the Gender Commission. Um, then I'll give the honorable members a moment to come back. So, Sakile, if you could unmute your microphone. Um, okay, I'm not sure. Sakile, kindly unmute again. I had muted everyone. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, just to clarify, 
the counter proposal that we are making as civil society is that the division of the seats on gender lines is 105 or 979 at local government to women, 979 at local government to men, and another 105 in parliament um, for men. In other words, the current seats that are what we call direct election seats or constituencies and wards, those would be shared between men and women. So it is not to say that one gender is being excluded, but rather is to say that uh, each gender have an equitable number of, uh, of seats. Um, that's the first uh, clarification. Secondly, the second clarification is to say that within the seats that we are speaking about, we are not making reference to the current quota, which is the 60 seats. So the seat rotation that was being proposed was rotating the, the, the 1,958 seats and the uh, 210 direct constituency seats between the two genders. Then, in terms of how would these seats be delimit, um, how would these seats be selected to say this ward or this constituency would be a male seat or a female seat? Our proposal is that we have a new body, a, a new process under the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, which involves multiple stakeholders, including the political parties and uh, civil society, to do a, a an exercise of delimitation as uh, and zec currently within its constitutional powers already has the powers uh, to do delimitation in, including other sectors such as gender so it can include gender as a form of delimitation the third question around um, um, resourcing of political parties. The reference is being made to the existing framework on how political parties receive resources from the government. And in this regard, we are making direct reference. To... Sorry, is that me? I don't know what happened. Uh, tech support, could you kindly mute? Tech support, can you kindly mute it? Uh, thank you, Bella. I've muted everyone. Sakile, you may unmute yourself again. Uh, thank you so much. The, the, the reference to the Political Parties uh, Finances Act is referring to the current mechanism that we have to resource political parties. And our proposal is that in that receiving of resources of political parties, those resources should be able to have um, report, the, the amounts should be reported and the, the amounts in terms of expenditure should be reported, but they must it must be gender segregated. But we are also proposing a limit to how much political parties can spend during the electoral cycle so that there is almost uh, equality or equity rather in the uh, uh, spending of resources of, of, of campaigns. In terms of how this would be monitored, we would then require political uh, candidates at nomination would field their, their, their budgets as we see in other, in other or, their, or their funding limits rather, as we see in other jurisdictions. Then there was a specific question around the uh, just a second i was just noting can i just make a reference to the other document the inclusion of the 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 youth our proposal includes um trying to look at the fielding patterns the nomination patterns and the candidate success patterns of not just men or not and women but also of youth uh, and other areas are persons living with disabilities. And our proposal uh, is the most sustainable long-term proposal in terms of how we can include diversity uh, in our electoral spaces. Uh, and you will see that the idea of having a youth quota uh, means that there is only, we have created a one-third a one um, uh, one third representation of the the three groups, but if you look at the numbers, if we are to count them manually, it means that a, a political party has four ways of splitting uh, its diverse groups in its party. It can do men, it can do women, it can do other areas of 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 uh, um, diversity, and it can also do youth. And there is enough in terms of the numerical count to be able to give us uh, candidates and also those who will hold seats in a in a diverse way. Uh, thank you very much. Bella, you may have to unmute yourself. Oh, can I come in? 
Thank you. We'll go to Virginia. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Bella. And thank you very much to the co-conveners of this meeting, which is very useful and very key and relevant for this particular time in Zimbabwe. And I just want to appreciate the efforts by the coalition of the different organizations that came together to put this paper, whose contents actually converge with the Zimbabwe Commission, Zimbabwe Gender Commission's position, where we are saying that we really feel that the constitution is very clear in terms of the need for gender equality and non-discrimination and does not necessarily end the whatever is being proposed within the constitutional amendment is much less than the benchmark that the constitution gives us so we want to appreciate the efforts of the various organizations that have come together and also the parliamentary portfolio committee for this time of dialogue uh, i'll just end by a question specifically where we want to understand as the Zimbabwe Gender Commission on the issue of the youth quota. We understand that it says that uh, there will be 10 seats reserved for youths, of which five of them are supposed to be for women. And we have been trying to also understand how practically that is going to be done, because from where we are sitting, it's only probably one seat that would be able to go to a province, to each of the provinces, if they're going to use the format that was used for the 60 seats. So we just want to understand from the members of parliament, from their dialogue with the executive, have they actually gotten to a point of how the 10 seats in the event in the, and we really hope that it doesn't come to that, but in the event that we get to a point where the constitutional amendment is what's being used, how practically is that going to happen in terms of the uh, inclusion of the youths? Thank you. Because it's 10 seats and it's one seat per province. So how are you going to ensure that across the provinces, you then have the division that will give us the five seats for women? It's, it's something that we've not been able to wrap our heads, heads around. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Virginia. There's the mathematics. Um, and that's been very useful to have your contribution. We'll go over to Agnes. Honorable members, may I request um, that you hear Agnes via her interpreter, Onai. Onai, are you going to unmute your microphone, please? Thank you. Um, and tech support, is there a way you can show both Agnes and Onai for us, uh, for the honorable members to appreciate the very powerful thing that they are doing in terms of disability inclusion in um, this consultation that they agreed to have. Take support if you could. Thank assist. you, Bella. So we have spotlighted Onai so that all of us can be able to see Onai. But I would request that all of us, if you check at the front of your screen, where you see the participants that are in this meeting, you can go to Agnes and then choose an option to pin video so that you also see Agnes. Thank you, tech support. As Onai is using her voice, it may be useful um, to interchange spotlighting between Onai and Agnes, um, if you are able, tech support. If it's not viable, we understand. We just wanted to try something different. Uh, Over to you, Onai and Agnes. Thank you very much, Bella, and greetings to everyone. So the first thing Agnes has said, she's trying to, she's trying to reconnect, actually, uh, because she, there's no Zesa in her place anymore. So she sent me her contribution, and then she said, um, I'll read it through. Uh, I don't know how long it will take uh, for the Zesa to come back, but I wanted to say, to talk about the representation of persons with disabilities at all levels, and not just the upper house. For, so, for example, currently we have two senators, which for over two million persons with disabilities, and these senators have the same disability. So, how do they know what other disability types have? So, is it possible that also within our contributions we also remember that disability is not just a homogeneous group, but also persons with disabilities come in their diversity. So, we also have to acknowledge that in all the discussions that we are going to do, um, especially when we're talking about young women. We also remember that young women with disabilities, they come in their diversities. And that's why I'm saying that we need to have them included at all levels. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And thank you, Tech Support, for your assistance. Ona, you can mute your microphone. Um, we will then have uh, our honorable members coming back with further inputs. I'll begin with Honorable Misai Rabwi, and then I'll go on to Honorable Raidza. So Honorable Misai Rabwi, could you please unmute your microphone and kindly proceed? Honorable Misai Rabwi. While we wait for Honorable Misai Rabwi, I'm going to do a time check. It's okay. 12. Uh -huh. Carry on. Please carry on. <laughs> All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'd missed it. I, I, I think it's, it's just, I'm just going back to the earlier comments. And I think, um, I think it's Honorable Kashiri that, that raised that same concern. Um, it does look like we do not have one position. Because if you, if, if we have a group that is saying, let's not touch the constitution at all, that's one. Then we have a group that is saying we need to touch the constitution, but only in terms of changing the voting system. Then I don't see how that will be done without touching the constitution. Because let's, let's go to the proposal that is there, which is the rotational one. And if you go to section 124, which speaks to the composition, it specifically sets out how parliament is going to be composed. And you are basically making a suggestion that that particular way of composition needs to be changed. So I'm not, I, I can't see how else that could be done without necessarily going back and amending the constitution. And I'm hearing a lot of this with a lot of people that we are meeting in civic society that we start from a position of let's not even touch the constitution. But as we go further, we realize that fundamentally, if we are going to have the things that we want done, i.e. ensuring that we have a 50-50, there is no way you are going to do a subsidiary legislation without going back to the foundational section, which talks to issues of composition. And that is just one example of what I'm talking about. Uh, somebody raised the issue around the need for going back to issues of delimitation and ensuring that in de deciding which constituencies will be f e women only, you need to rope in uh, a ZEC for delimitation. There is no way you're going to go just to amend the act, the electoral act around delimitation without dealing with the fundamental clause in the constitution that deals with delimitation. Because constitution it that limitation the criteria that we are wanting to bring in oh, you I'm have sorry. To, oh, sorry you lost me bella yes i lost can you, you repeat yourself can you okay i'm not sure where i lost you um, where did you were I talking about ZEC and delimitation? That's where yes. we lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thanks, my dear. So I, I'm saying if you are going to make the proposal around delimitation, which speaks to a gender based delimitation, it means you have to go to the clause that is in the constitution that deals with delimitation because that clause does not have gender based delimitation as a criteria. So I, I, I'm not sure where the let's not touch it and then come back with the things that you still want changed and i think honorable Gordon has also raised that to say you can't there are certain circumstances where you can't touch the electoral act without touching the foundational issues that are within within uh, within the constitution uh, but i'm sorry but i may have to to dash off to another meeting but i just thought i needed to to raise uh, those issues. So if you, if there are responses to it, I'll catch on with my other honorable members and hear what happened because I'm going to have to leave the meeting. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your contribution and for your invaluable time. Honorable members, we're going to take two more inputs from yourselves, Honorable Raidza and then Honorable Maposa. In view of time, um, I think that is where we will leave it. If I'm able to take more contributions, I will. Please bear with me. 
we had promised that we would end at 12.50. Honorable um, Raiza, could you please go ahead? Uh, thank you very much, Bella. My contribution is uh, on the issue of quota system. Uh, I am in for the gender balancing, uh, but um, I just want a clarity on those who are pushing for more of the quota for the youth as well as the quota for the women. I'm in for section 17, but my argument for, I mean, to those who are pushing for, the, for, the, for those two quotas is that um, uh, with the previous experience, are we also not uh, trying to encourage our youth not, and our women as well not to run for the 210 constituencies or to compete in the actual competition rather than themselves competing against one another. I'm saying this on the background of the information that, for instance, in the 2018 elections, we have seen other women, for instance, moving from competing in the actual constituencies, coming to compete in the quota system. Then if we come again with this youth thing, I will also not encouraging our youth who were already maybe for for instance elected in the constituents in the current parliament for instance to move to say ah, i think it's easier for me to get back to parliament when i go to the quarter rather than to to, to compete in the 210 constituents it's just for argument's sake and i want a little bit of clarity on that aspect to say are we not really like progressively uh going backwards rather of progressively moving towards our 50-50. Thank you very much. Ah, fair point. Thank you very much. Our civil society leaders are noting the inputs from the honorable members and we'll give them a chance to just wrap up um, in response. Honorable Maposa, if you could please turn your microphone on um, and give us your input. Honorable Maposa. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Please go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you. First, I would like to apologize for coming to the meeting late. I had other commitments that uh, spilled over to my time. Uh, unfortunately, I did not ha have to hear a lot of things that we said here, but I would want to believe uh, that uh, according to the um, to the points that were given, that the meeting was uh, about the 50-50 and the 25% of the youth uh, quota. What I would like, just want to say is, um, as civil society, since you are going to come up with a position paper, you sh you must be clear on what you want uh, to be added in the constitutional, constitutional amendments because we risk at times to have our points mixed together. And at the end of the day, somebody does not know exactly what we want. So like we were discussing in previous meetings, uh, we have to be clear that to, do we want the, the quota system to continue, I mean, the proportional representation, the quota system to continue as it is. If not, we need to have clear points on how we want uh, it to be done. Like when I came into the meeting, I heard others talking about the tenses for the youth and they were saying how uh, feasible is it going to be. So it is your time as civic society, as the youth, to say we need it to be done this way. Because if you leave it like that, what uh, take precedence, even if we debate in parliament, what will come out at the end of the day is the constitution itself. If we don't amend it in the constitution, it will remain the same. What is going to happen is us having to extend the quota system, but without uh, the amendments that you need. So I'm saying this is a chance for the civil society, for the women groups, for the youth groups to come out clear on how, what they want. If they want the extension, how do they want it done? Because if we just say we want it, then the constitution will take precedent to say political parties will bring the list. So um, for, for some of the things that we discussed when I'm, I was not there, I will hear from other honorable members. For now, I'll just end here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Maposa. And well done for being tech savvy. Um, you were sending your request to speak via the DM, which is very, very useful. 
and supportive of your moderator. Honorable Chi Nyanganya, are you there? Yes, yeah, yeah, please um, proceed. Yeah. Okay, please proceed. Uh, tech support, could you spotlight the honorable member, please? They've got their video live. Okay, great. Thank you. You may proceed whilst we are spotlighting you. Thank you. All right. Honorable member, please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. I've been listening um, to the contribution uh, from the civil society and from uh, fellow members. My contribution will be um, the feasibility of um, the youth quota system. I do concur with uh, the other previous uh, members who said uh, we're talking about the issue of uh, the youth um, not being able to to really contest for for the for the for the two ten uh, seats, in as much as the youth are constitute uh, the majority of of the population, I agree they need to be empowered. But we can't empower them by giving free freebies on a silver platter. They need to work um, for the constituencies. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for that input. Yes. Statistically, 75% of Zimbabwe's population is from young people, people aged 35 and under. So your point is very valid. And I believe that um, the contribution has spoken to that. Honorable Nduna, if you could contribute. And then Honorable Ma Vetera, you'll be our last member of parliament. Uh, tech support, Honorable Nduna has a video available for us. Well done, you're wearing your mask. We are very proud of you. Uh, please go ahead, Honorable Nduna. Well, thank you so very much, um, uh, Madam. What I just want to, uh, to put across is that uh, the constitution, the current constitution, uh, there's no death in terms of uh, the inclusion of the youth. So as you discuss, as you debate, you need to introspectively uh, interrogate uh, the constitution where it says for one to be a member of parliament, you have one to be above uh, 21 years of age and you, you, you basically need to be a Zimbabwean and a registered voter, nothing else. Uh, so you'll find that as, um, as Zimbabwe, we have quite a youthful population and uh, they, they are quite aggressive and they are, quite, um, they, they, they are also quite ambitious. You would want to know that they have included themselves in the current dispensation through uh, the through their inclusion in, in the 210 seats. So as you deal with uh, the issues of the youths, do not uh, segregate them completely to say these uh, those that need a quota system. We have youths that have taken it upon themselves between the ages of 18 and 35. And they have said, I am going to take the bull by the horns and uh, make sure that I get what I can and can what I get, get what I uh, get what I want from what we have. So this is what I thought I should uh, put across to you. So as you interrogate this, please be alive to the scenario and the situation that the youths uh, allowed uh, in the current uh, dispensation of the current uh, constitution. The, the constitution is not death in terms of um, uh, the, the, the limitation of the youth. It is actually open-ended, yeah, to say the least. Thank you, Honorable Nduna. Honorable Mavetera will be our last contributor um, from our honorable parliamentarians and the committee that has given us their time. Um, it is now quarter to one. We have five minutes left. After Honorable Mavetera has spoken, we will then give um, Tawanda Chimini a few minutes to say something. He's from the Election Resource Center. Um, remember, he was on the call and we lost him. He's come back. He's got a few things he'd like to say. We will then hear from Sakile Sifelani uh, from the Women in Politics Support Unit. And lastly, from our hosts, Glanis, um, you will wrap up the meeting for us. So, Honorable Mavetera, if you could proceed. 
All right, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to say on the issue of the 25%, which is uh, youth quarter, one thing that I think we also need to take cognizance of is that uh, right now we still have a policy and we do not have an act. So there's great need for us to be having an act which will then make it highly enforceable. Because as it stands now, uh, we are saying that we need 25% of the young people, but it's just a policy. So there is need for, for the youth act then to be enacted so that at least it can then become highly enforceable. And then the other issue that I was saying uh, is that when we say 35 years, if you come to think of it, we have got international bodies that recognize youth, which is 35 years and below. So if we're going to be having MPs coming in, let's say they're 35 years, nine months, would that person be able to represent young people effectively? Or maybe there is need now for us to put it a little bit down and then probably maybe make it to, let's say, 30 years. Why is that so? So that at least that person, we know very well that this person is going for a five-year term, which will make them then become 40, then when they need to, to 40 years old, if they're going to finish their term. So what it means is that this person won't be representing the young people, for we know that international bodies recognize the international charter, I would say the youth international charter, it recognizes youth are below 35 years old. So what is it that we really need today? Is it just 35 years? Or maybe we'd need a cap that will allow us to then be able to go off to make sure that at least we'll actually that person will actually become a young person. And then uh, the other issue again is that on that youth quarter again, even on, on the 105 seats, I still insist to say, how then are we going to make sure that, because if you look at it, we're going to be having a lot of constituencies that will be having, say, let's say female, let's say we, we, are, we are fostering for the gender, uh, gender equality issue. On the, on the young people, I'm saying to myself, which ones are going to get the faith which are going to be female and which ones are going to get the faith which are male? Uh, so what is it that we are saying? Would it not be prudent for us even to push a way forward to say, if possible, maybe we want 10 seats for, 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 for female and 10 seats for women. So that, it, for, for, I mean, for, for male, uh, especially on the youth quarter, maybe for us to maybe uh, be able to, 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 to foster maybe for, or advocate for 20 seats. But then if we don't, may, maybe if we don't succeed on the 20 seats, at least on the 10, how then are we all going to make it possible for us to be having the five seats for men and five seats for women and make sure that at least we, 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 we get a representation that will make everyone be happy as young people. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Maretera. Uh, very valuable contributions from you there. And we also see that you have your mask. So we applaud you uh, for promoting safe health. Thank you very much. Um, let's move over then to Tawanda Chimini. Tawanda, you've got uh, three minutes to make your brief input and then Saki, and then we'll wrap up with Glanis. Tawanda, please go ahead. Tawanda, can you unmute your microphone, please? All right, thank you, Bella. I think I'll, I'll do this in um, um, a minute or a minute and a half, but um, just quick points. Number one, from our assessment, and I hope we can clarify this to members of parliament, if the intention of the constitutional amendment, uh, bill number two, is to improve gender parity, in elected position as one of the intentions. Our view is that as experienced over the last six, seven, six, seven years with uh, the new constitution, doing it in the constitution alone is not sufficient. In fact, it hasn't achieved what the intention of the constitution is. Hence, our attempt to highlight to the committee that there are other ways in which such gender parity can be achieved. And it is our submission that we can achieve more through focusing, for instance, on the Electoral Act, um, through focusing more on issues of political party finance, through focusing more on dealing with how we put in enabling legislation, for instance, on issues such as delimitation. So on two important issues that, uh, will, will, that helps us highlight this point. Number one, the question of Section 124 of the Constitution to where the Constitution talks about the composition of the National Assembly. They, in, in Section 124.2 of that, of that part of the Constitution, it says that elections of members of the National Assembly must be conducted in accordance with the electoral law. So when we talk about how you can allocate 105 seats and 900 and something uh, seats at the local authority level, and of course the 105 at the parliamentary level, this can actually be fixed through the, 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 the Electoral Act, and we don't need to amend Section 124 of the Constitution. 
The same applies for issues of uh, delimitation. It may be correct to argue, and I'm not a lawyer, to argue that uh, it, you may need an amendment to Section 161 of the Constitution in, in terms of addressing the delimitation process. Because for you to get the 210 seats, there should be a delimitation process. But our submission is that you don't need to amend the delimitation clause um, under Section 161. Um, all you need to do is to give effect to the delimitation process through the Electoral Act and then focus particularly on two sections of Section 161 of the Constitution. The first section being Section 161, 6C, which talks about geographic distribution of voters, and 6D, which talks about a community of interest as registered voters. That opens up ways in which the Election Commission administratively can then begin to think about how they allocate those seats. And there are ways in which other countries have done this. Just like, you know, in, in the past, whenever there was a draw in an election, there was what was called drawing of lots. Where okay, if there Barbara, was a tie I'm in the afraid, numbers... I'm afraid I, I really need to ask you to wrap up your... Input. All right. So, 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 so basically, the, the insistence here really is that we can achieve more in terms of attaining gender parity without necessarily amending the constitution. There is still a lot more that we can make use of in the current constitution to give effect and in fact improve the numbers of uh, women representation and youth representation without going back to amend what has already been provided for. Um, so um, I, I hope Saki will also come in and, and cover the things that I've not been able to highlight at this moment. But thank you for the, for the opportunity to present. Thank you, Tawanda. Thank you very much. Saki, if you could unmute your microphone. Thank you very much. I think to just buttress the position that we're making as a collective is to say that uh, in our view collectively, we do not think that achieving the highest standards of inclusion and uh, diversity uh, and non-discrimination need to be directed through a constitutional amendment. Our position is that there are lots of subsidiary acts that do not wow. require um, um, that, that, that do not require constitutional amendment for the, uh, the legislators to be able to strengthen that and attend to and still maintain a high level of diversity and non-discrimination. Secondly, we raise the issue of the electoral oh. amendment act to deal with deficiencies arising to how political parties field their candidates to raise uh, issues around how political parties support candidates through their own internal candidate selection processes and ultimately up until we get to nomination court. So in our view, in society, and also as those who are working on issues of gender and gender equality, the constitutional uh, amendment process is not appropriate for meeting the needs that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saki, for tying it up so neatly. Um, and indeed, so intelligently and informedly. Uh, Glanis, I'm going to hand over to you. We don't expect you to answer all the questions that have been put to you um, within the time that we have left, but rather perhaps diplomatically to use the time that we have to express your gratitude um, and indicate how you will do follow up work. Glanis? Uh, Lannis, kindly unmute yourself. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Bella, for the opportunity. And thank you so much to colleagues from civil society for really demonstrating that in I, civil society, the position that we are tabling here is not a, an individual position for an organization, but it's really a collective um, package that you're bringing to the parliament. Um, Bella, I would not have done um, justice to myself if I don't respond to this one particular question before I wrap up. Uh, the issue around whether we are not now uh, stifling women and youth competitiveness by requesting them to reserve constituencies. Um, I, I want to, to remind um, the, the, the parliamentarians and also ourselves to say that 
bringing the issue of gender parity and bringing the issue of um, youth by allocating certain uh, constituencies for them actually emanates from acknowledging that we have got um, historical um, you know, factors that have contributed to us getting to the position where we are today, where the women and the youth are underrepresented. And yes, our constitution and the various other regional and international instruments that we have, have actually um, provided for the full rights of those citizens to equally be represented. However, those rights may not be attained if we also don't deal with the societal, historical um, challenges that we have that still uh, make young women, women and youth find it difficult to compete within the same terrain um, as, um, um, as their male counterparts. And hence these propositions that we are making to say that the, the Parliament of Zimbabwe and other key government institutions need to acknowledge these differences and actually express their full commitment towards a genuine um, realization of seeing women and youth participate by ensuring that the policy and legal framework allows for them to be able to do so. And when we are then asking for reserved seats, we are actually when saying we want reserved constituencies where we can actually compete, where they actually exercise their agents to contest, to engage with their constituencies and offer themselves to say, this is what we are going to do, and they can actually be uh, held accountable to that. We are not asking for reserved seats where women are imposed and they are put there by um, political parties without having engaged with their constituencies. That's why we are continuously making these calls to say, let's acknowledge the historical differences that we have and make sure that the policy and legal environment provides for these groups to be able to do so. Um, as I, I wrap up, I want to acknowledge the commitment to duty by the executive, um, especially by coming up with the proposed uh, amendments bill as a way of implementing the constitution. We deeply appreciate that commitment. However, we would like to reiterate that that commitment can actually benefit Zimbabwe more if that commitment is practiced in a very democratic, highly participatory and inclusive process that ensures that the marginalized communities and groups of women, youth and other actors who have always been disadvantaged in our politics actually have an opportunity to meaningfully contribute towards the processes around the implementation of the constitution. And as we are speaking today, parliament is set to start public hearings in a period where many people are actually restrained in terms of movement due to the global health pandemic of COVID-19. And what that does, it, it buttresses the very historical factors that we're talking about here, where these groups are not able to contribute their voices, they're not able to contribute their agency because they are being marginalized in technical ways. And therefore, what we are calling for today is that, um, Parliament actually um, ensure that the, the, the public hearings are at least suspended for now. Um, they are suspended until such a time when the environment is safe for everyone to be able to participate and contribute to uh, their views towards uh, the constitutional amendment, Bill number two. And secondly, as they suspend, we are saying that as civil society, we have tabled alternative positions, which we are saying, while you wait to do the procedure, as indicated by the chairperson of the committee, that at this point, they can't simply say no to it. They need to conduct public hearings. We are saying we are providing you with alternative uh, mechanisms that you can start to think about and ask how these can actually be put in place without necessarily amending the constitution. And with that, um, I would like to respond to Honorable Mavetera um, in closing to say that you've constantly asked how this is going to be done, how the youth will be selected, and how the constituencies will be identified, and how everything will be done according to the constitution. I think our engagement with uh, the parliament today, with you today as the broader civil society, is an expression of our commitment that we are available. We want to continue thinking with you, working with government institutions to ensure that we actually uh, end up having the very uh, 
exact policies that we want to see in place to advance women and youth participation. And with this, Bella, I would like to deeply, deeply appreciate um, your excellent facilitation and to also once again, thank very much the honorable members for making time uh, to be with us during these difficult times and still uh, stretching themselves to do this online with us. Uh, and as well as appreciating our fellow civil society counterparts who are here present and also our partners who are sitting in the different corners of this country. Uh, thank you very much and thank you so much as well to our tech um, support who has done an amazing job to ensure that we've managed to have um, quite a conversation without as many disruptions. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glanis, um, and thank you very much to the Institute for Young Women in Development for facilitating and hosting this dialogue with the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee on Justice, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs. In that vein, let me, through your committee chairperson, uh, Honorable Mataranyika, thank all the members of parliament of the committee who have made time to be on this call. And you've asked incisive, thoughtful questions, showing your interest, and we value that. Uh, the spirit of dialogue has really been demonstrated in the last two hours. So we really thank you for your support and your willingness. Um, relatedly, let me also say thank you to the civil society activists and leaders and practitioners who are on the call as well as those who supported us with technology. Um, it is exactly one o'clock. My job was to close for you by one o'clock. Without any further remarks, I now call our meeting to a close. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe and have a very good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.